gosh, I don't think there's anything quite more frightening than being on, <laughs> on a stage in front of school children. <laughs> I'd forgotten what it was like. <laughs> it's such a long time ago. Um, so you've been herded in here today to listen to me talking about Charles Dickens. Who has heard of Charles Dickens? Anybody? Who has never heard of Charles Dickens? Anybody never heard of him? You've never heard of him? Then you, my talk is specially for you because I want to share what I know about him with you. You walked in cold to a room full of adolescent young women to perform Dickens. What do you think, what's the challenge in doing that? It is a huge challenge just to walk into a, a room of teenagers who are not interested in Charles Dickens, and I am interested in him, and the job is just to hope that I leave them wanting to read him. Uh, it, it's a huge challenge, and I think it's a challenge for teachers too, which maybe is why he's not on the syllabus. I'm appalled to hear that. And I hope that people will change their minds and put him on the syllabus. I'm sorry you don't know anything about Charles Dickens. Let me try and change that a bit. Well, I was born and brought up in England. And in England, he is regarded alongside Shakespeare as the greatest writer, the greatest writer of prose, the greatest creator of characters. Guess how many characters he created? Throw me a number. Okay, up on that. 150? Who said a million? Stand up, please. Stand up, please. You knew it couldn't be a million, didn't you? That was a little tease for me. <laughs> I will tell you how many. 2,000. I don't understand the younger generation, and uh, I have no children, so I don't have to understand them, really. I, I hope that they pull themselves out of this pit of social networking. I think it's time they just put their heads in a book and not in a screen. Lady uh, who said a million, do you think 2,000 is quite a lot? Do you think it's quite a lot? It's more than anybody else ever did in the history of the world. 2,000 creatures he invented. 2,000 lives, 2,000 stories. I didn't know what I was going to read them today when I came. And when I was looking through Great Expectations up there, I thought I can't take hours looking for the bit that I want. I'm a very good sight reader. So what I read, I had not prepared. I simply found it and I thought, yes, I can make something work out of that. I can, I can make it dramatic for them. Because that's what Dickens is so good at doing at making a scene, making it live like drama in front of you. And um, that's what I was trying to do. I, I hope it worked. I thought they were great kids. Somebody, somebody said that I probably scared them. Has anybody ever read a Dickens novel right the way through? Hand up. Right up! So, not really very many have read a Dickens novel right the way through. One there. Is he, do you think he's boring? Some people think he's a bit boring. He was an extraordinary man, and he had incredible energy. He would walk 30 miles through the night. He would write letters, edit books, give speeches. He wrote Pickwick Papers and Oliver Twist at the same time. Unbelievable. So he was a great example of, 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 as, a, as a dynamo, which was what the Victorians loved. They loved energy in all its aspects. But he was the most brilliant comedian. 
I'll do just a little bit from my show, which maybe will make you laugh. And then I will stop. There are two people on the stage, but there's only me. The two people are Mrs. Corney from Oliver Twist, the matron of the workhouse, and Mr. Bumble, the beadle from the workhouse. Mr. Bumble has come visiting. He has an agenda in his head. Mrs. Corney is sitting, having a cup of tea, and the bell rings. Oh, dear me! Is that Mr. Bumble? At your service, Mom, said Mr. Bumble, who was stopping outside to rub his shoes clean and to shake the snow from his coat, and who now made an appearance bearing a cocked hat in one hand and a stick in the other. Uh, shall I shut the door, Mom? The lady modestly hesitated to reply, lest there should be any impropriety in holding an interview with Mr. Bumble with closed doors. Mr. Bumble, feeling very cold himself, shut it without permission. Hard weather, Mr. Bumble. Ah, oh, indeed, Mum. Anti-parochial weather this morning. We've given away, Mrs. Corney, we've given away a matter of 20 quartan loaves and a cheese and half this very blessed afternoon. And yet them paupers is not contented. Of course not, Mr. Bumble. When would they be? That's the way with these people, Mum. Give them a apron full of coals today and they'll come back the day after tomorrow as brazen as alabaster. And Mrs. Corney, the great principle of out-of-door relief is to give them paupers exactly what they don't want and then they get tired of coming. Oh, dear me, that's a good one too. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Bumble took up his hat and stick as if to go. Oh, you'll have a very cold walk, Mr. Bumble. It blows, Mum. <laughs> Enough to cut one's ears off. The matron looked from the little kettle to the beadle who was moving towards the door. And as the beadle coughed, <coughs> preparatory to bidding her good night, bashfully inquired whether, whether he wouldn't take a cup of tea. <laughs> Mr. Bumble instantaneously turned his collar back again, laid his hat and stick upon a chair and drew another chair up to the table. As he slowly seated himself, he looked at the lady. Mrs. Corney applied herself to the task of making his tea. Uh, sweet, Mr. Bumble. Very sweet indeed, ma'am. <laughs> Mr. Bumble fixed his eyes on Mrs. Corney as he said this, and if ever a beadle looked tender, Mr. Bumble was that beadle at that moment. <laughs> Will you have a cat, ma'am, I see. And kittings, too, I declare. Oh, yes. I'm so fond of them, you can't imagine. They're so happy, so frolicsome. <laughs> and so cheerful, they're quite companions for me. Very nice animals, ma'am. So very domestic. Now, the thing that Dickens did that was so remarkable was that he didn't just draw a character and make them 
flat on the page. He gave them life because he gave them lots of qualities. When you think of a person you know, they're not just one adjective, but they're several because we all have layers in our lives, layers in our characters. And you know the most interesting thing about each single one of us, you, me and everybody, we have secrets. We have things that we don't want people to know, that we don't go on Facebook and Twitter and talk about. Those of you who are silly enough to waste your time on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> because there's a lot out there besides that. But it's the secrets that we all have. He, he was totally committed to his message, which is to promulgate good. He was a Christian, um, a simple kind of Christian, and he believed in Christ's message. Well, I think Christ was a great politician. And although I'm not a Christian and not indeed a believer, I deeply respect and welcome that insistence on do as you would be done by. I went to a university, Cambridge in England, and so I'm quite well educated. It's a great gift. It's a wonderful thing. It certainly has made me a better actor. But they didn't have that, Shakespeare and Dickens. What they had was the power of observation. They could look at people and find out from the way they walked, the way they spoke, the way they stood, the way they glanced, the way they didn't face you in the eye, what kind of people they were. And they used that information when they were writing, when they were creating characters. I, I think that he was always on the side of the underdog, of the least powerful. And you know, any society which concentrates only on the strong is a deeply flawed and sick society. And we're getting like that. We have to concentrate on the weak, the stupid... <laughs> Mr. Bambo. <laughs> it's a no use disguising facts, Mom. I think our society does need mending. I think Dickens saw that and felt it and knew it. And I think all his writings are testaments to the necessity to lead a moral life. And the strange thing is that he didn't do it himself. And that's the paradox that my show explores. I was just going to say, the experience when people leave your show, what is the difference between what you believe they may have understood before they walked in and what you know they understand when they leave? They usually say to me, because I, I always go in the foyer afterwards and I sign books and programmes and talk to people, and they all say, God, I never knew he was such a rotter, but I must go and get some books. And that's how it should be. Know the man, know the work. Lady Gaga, right, Lady Gaga. Could you imagine writing and reading and being taught about the state of modern music today without mentioning Lady Gaga? I can't. She was like Dickens. Dickens, believe it or not, when he lived, and he was born 200 years ago, 1812, and he died in 1870. So I can tell you he was 58 when he died. He was the most famous man in the world. In the world. The world was smaller then than it is now, but he was the greatest celebrity in the world. People would queue up in America when he went there to see him drink a glass of water. They would queue up to look at him, opening his mouth and pouring water down it. That's a celebrity, all right. That's how big he was. 
So, I guess it's hard to teach Dickens now to people because they think that he might be boring. The most terrifying thing for a teacher is to think they might be teaching something boring. I don't give a tuppenny fart whether it's boring or not. You will listen. You will pay attention. You will learn. That is your function now. You are students. This is the only time in your life, probably, given up entirely to learning. Lucky you, my goodness. Who's seen me in Harry Potter? <laughs> ah, me. Culture has changed. 